All right. Thank you sir, so much uh, for being with us, Serge. I really appreciate your time here. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad uh, to join. Sir, you, you have a very interesting um, uh, life story as well as how you got to the point where you are through a lot of experimentation and um, adventures in different fields. So let's start with your, um, your um, journey from Costa Rica. Um, how, how do you remember your childhood? Um, and what did you learn from uh, being in a country that's mostly um, known for its fruits and electronics and not um, the Silicon Valley like advanced um, AI um, field? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I lived there at a time where it was uh, transitioning still uh, from, you know, being, uh, you know, mostly known for coffee and bananas and and those things and to, uh, you know, attracting high tech stuff, mostly electronics, nothing software related, although there is like a homegrown like software industry in the country. It was like, um, you know, attracting Intel and, and at the moment, it's one of the largest manufacturers of like medical devices. But um, yeah, I, I was kind of there in the transition. So um, yeah, I, I remember uh, growing up uh, near like uh, farms and, and things like that. And just a matter of few years, it was just all like <laughs> strip malls and, and uh, um, you know, like convenience stores and, 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 and uh, you know, multiplex movie theaters and things like that. Um, but, you know, uh, early on, it wasn't like that at all. Um, you know, in, in, in the early 90s, it was still like, uh, you know, coffee farms everywhere. <laughs> and in and, and a few short years, the coffee farms were gone and it was all like, uh, you know, like uh, urbanization. And, and so it just very quickly developed. Um, what didn't was like, of course, like the software, uh, you know, by the time I, I, I graduated, um, or, or actually by the time I was in college, actually, there was, uh, there were like uh, software companies, but they were mostly in the counting space, which I found kind of boring, uh, to be honest. <laughs> and um, there were multinationals setting out, uh, kind of trying to attract uh, local talent, but the, what they were using the local talent for wasn't uh, pretty much much of my interest. It was like more like support staff uh, for multinationals, like taking advantage of the proximity with the U.S. and the fact that a lot of them, a lot of us speak English, um, you know, it, it just made sense to try to exploit local talent as support staff, um, you know, on technical roles. But you know, like I, I, I wasn't interested in that either. Um, yeah, so I, I actually there was another industry that was moving down um, for you know, completely like uh, jurisdictional reasons. Uh, it, and it's uh, the online gambling industry. So that's the one I kind of uh, cut my teeth in, uh, you know, and it was good because like given, given legalities and things like that, they couldn't like uh, have cloud services. And even then I don't think there were cloud services they could use. So everything um, was done in house. Uh, you know, from, you know, like the servers to the websites to the, uh, uh, even the software for the betting, you know, which is very interesting. I, I got in, uh, engaged with uh, random number generators, uh, you know, like for slot machines, like building, uh, you know, learning about horse tracks and, and how to do horse reporting. <laughs> it sounds all bizarre, but um, yeah, I, I learned a whole lot doing all these things from scratch. I even uh, was one of the first people to engage, well, that I knew of with uh, video streaming. Um, so, uh, you know, back in like 2000, I think it's five or four, it was still very new, like new, but nobody was doing video streaming. And, um, you know, I, I was learning all the ins and outs uh, by scratch and kind of building my own video streaming player in, in Flash. <laughs> um, yeah, for, for my work, you know. So that, that, uh, that was a really good way to learn new things. Um, of course, that also meant there was a lot of hats I was wearing and, and you know, like there wasn't like an official, you know, like 
there was my title didn't correspond to all the different things I did, you know. So I um, I all all that time I engaged with data, you know. All my, all the sites I ever did were data driven, you know, since like two thousand onwards. So um, and and data started to get bigger and bigger, and um, you know, like then. I could see the flip side of the equation because early on, you know, you couldn't store more than a few days worth of log files. It was just so big. There was just so much traffic coming in into these sites. You, you know, it was just wasteful. Um, and you only had so much hard drive. But then as hard drives became cheaper, you could store months worth and then you could start to see trends. So um, like often I would be asked, you know, show us the trends, what's going on? You know, you know, beyond like the, the bottom line, beyond, you know, whether sales figures, you know, what can you derive from that, from the traffic? How do that, does that translate? What are the most effective trends, you know, affiliates, you know, things like that. So, and, and not just on like a, a global level, but on an intricate level, you know, like what are the like relationships you see? So in a way I became a BI guy and I didn't know it <laughs> um, because there wasn't really a word for it. I think the first time I ever heard the term business intelligence was like, you know, like 2011 or 12, you know, like many years afterwards. Um, so I, I was always connected to the data, but I was kind of stuck doing like uh, a lot of development work or directing development work because then, you know, by the 2007 and six, I was already managing teams and um, <laughs> I, I did not, I didn't realize how much I despised it, to be honest. Um, I was really like pro project and product oriented. So like for me, there was always a purpose to the data, but um, like I didn't, I, I saw it as an end result of the product and, and that informed the product. I, and, and I still to a certain extent see it that way, but I, I didn't, disconnected from it in the sense that I've always felt I had to be building the product to deal with the data. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that kind of, I, I probably rambled on telling you other things, but, um, no, absolutely. Kind of, I mean, it, it's very it's interesting like the initial because there are a lot of people who, um, come to my show and were brilliant scientists. And it is kind of a pattern that I've noted in their life stories is that, you know, they're jack of all trades, interested and curious about so many different fields. Um, and, you know, from those experiences, they've learned to build um, patterns and, and intuitions about how things are going to play out. And that actually really, really helps when you are a data scientist, you know, you vein in all the things that you already know from the past. Um, sometimes people think that's kind of uh, metaphysical, uh, voodoo, but you know, a lot of people uh, don't realize that it takes a lot of experience and um, learning to get there. And one of the things that I noticed in their um, early careers is that they have very little resources to go with. And um, in a previous conversation, you talked about that you started to learn to program on a 4.77 megahertz, 256K, 256K uh, B RAM machine. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that, because I, that's, I think we all share that, um, you know, poor old days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, the thing is, uh, I think it so happened in, in the late 80s, I think. Um, my, my parents were, um, they were studying in the US. They were, uh, uh, my dad was getting a PhD and my mom a master's and uh, we, we were there. And uh, I don't know, they got a very good deal on a computer. And, and my mom was the one that was like really interested in computers. My dad was kind of stuck with a typing writer and he's like, no, I'm not gonna give this up. But you know, she, she was the one that pushed us there and, and being an economist, she was very interested in data. And I, I didn't see it like that then because I, I just saw her working with all these, you know, um, Jurassic kind of, you know, like spreadsheets, you know, the ones you would load it with the command line. And I mean, I can't even describe how they looked. I'm talking like Lotus. I don't know if you heard of that. And, um, you know, then databases like Fox Pro and so forth. And so she would, or DBase, I think it was called. And she would work on these things. I'm talking late 80s. And, and uh, well, they, they managed to get their hands on a computer. I kind of didn't Get, arrive at that point. It was a, a you know like a portable 
quote unquote P IBM PC, and I'm I'm telling you it's the size of a you know like a a table, you know, not a regular table, like a like a dining table. You know, that's how big the computer was, and uh, um, that's what they brought home one day, and and they they wanted me to use it, and um, there was no video games, nothing, but there was a manual for for basic. And I, I think I barely know how to read and write, but I, I, I started learning all these codes um, because I was a very curious child. And so I started to program in, in basic, um, you know, because I thought it was fun to learn. And what I would do mostly with it was just kind of silly, like try to do video games with it. So there were like little functions in basic to draw things on the screen, like like circles and dots and lines. And so I would play around with that, um, you know, and, and, and create like little programs around it. I don't really remember what they did, but I, I did things like yeah, that. Yeah, none of us do actually, you know, but, but that was fun time, you know, we started first learning visual basic and, you know, simple commands and how to print out um, the inputs. It was really interesting, but how did you, um, let's get to your book, which is such a fascinating read. It's, it's very loaded with, um, a lot of uh, terms, um, especially when it comes to interpretability. Um, and I'm glad someone wrote actually such a detailed book in order to understand what is uh, interpretability and explainability about, um, in a lot of tabloidish, like, um, AI coverage of um, the issue itself and bring some sanity and science into the topic is uh, probably much needed. And you talk about um, the framework FAT, which is fairness, accountability, and transparency. Let's talk a little bit about that before we can get deep into your um, book and talk about individual issues. Okay. You, you want to know why it's important or why it's important for me? Well, I guess both. <laughs> okay. Well, um, there, there are several reasons it's important for me. Like uh, the first one would be, well, uh, like I'm, I'm really curious to find the guts of things. And so when I, I, you know, like you fast forward several years from those days in Costa Rica, I, I created a startup um, and uh, that, that startup, you know, like managed to get um, incubated by Harvard. And um, it's, the startup is about decision-making you know, it's a search engine, but it's really about decision making. And and to me, like I I figured that the most optimal way of coming across search results was using some machine learning and big data. And so I did. But then I was frustrated as a programmer that's used to like debugging things and getting to the bottom of things, not finding that level of transparency with my with mach my machine learning models. You know, if I got certain results, I couldn't exactly understand why it arrived to those results. So that got me really frustrated and, and, and I, I didn't have a word for it then. I'm talking it's 2015. Yeah, there was literature about it, but it wasn't like something that was commonly talked. Um, you know, like the model did what it was supposed to do, what you trained it to do, and, and, and that was it. Um, so um, I, I start to dig deep in, into that concept and start to learn what it means and, and what there is about it written. There was very little written about it. It was mostly like in academic journals and I, that was frustrating. So that was like a, a point. And then when I learned that that transparency had to do with other things, ethical things, that connects a lot with my childhood. As I said, my, my parents, they're, they're social scientists. So, um, you know, my father is uh, international relations, my mom is economist and, and a development economist at that. So like I grew up hearing a lot about fairness, right? Um, and so uh, I, to me that connected emotionally, like uh, the fact that like not only weren't these models transparent, but they were performing unequally. And, and, and that kind of connected also with my startup because one of the motives for the startup was trying to create a leveling pill, playing field for businesses, as well as kind of um, disrupt a lot of the cognitive biases that we ourselves as consumers, as users of things have already. So uh, that kind of is the reason for me. Uh, in general, why it's important for, for, for everybody pretty much falls in the same reasons. We all expect decisions to have 
a level of transparency of accountability and fairness. That's kind of a, a given. Like when another human makes a decision, why don't we shouldn't be up, uphold like algorithmic decisions to the same standard? Not that humans always do, but I'm saying it's an expectation and it's a reasonable expectation to have. So like one of the things that got me excited about data science and it kind of falls into the thread I was, you know, you know, going across with my startup was I got involved in data science because ultimately like the, the thing that I care about the most is good decisions because that's, that's, that's the reason data, we use data. We use data not only to understand things better, but to make it possibly change outcomes with that information that we have. So if, if we're gonna rely on data, we have to be relying, and, and especially if it's going through the lens of a model, we're gonna have to do it through, you know, using transparency and accountability and fairness as some underlying principles. Because other than that, we can't really guarantee that decisions that are data informed are gonna be any better than decisions that are not. And that kind of defeats the purpose. I think there's a chasm between um, the origins of um, these perceived um, biases and what we call unfair. For example, we, you and I as technical people do understand that algorithms are just doing their job. So there's no um, right wing or left wing politicians sitting within the algorithm you know, deciding what things are going to be. And you talk about that in your book also that um, do you, when you're given a choice between um, fairness and preciseness, um, you know, it, it's a very hard line to walk on. Um, the um, trade-off between um, variance and bias um, can be a tricky one. So do you really think that, you know, people are to blame uh, or engineers specifically are to blame for uh, what people call um, unfair practices? Well, like, I think they're not. I mean, I, I think the question of accountability is is something that that must be kind of uh, it's it's a whole bunch of stakeholders that must take responsibility for that. It ultimately, it's not the machine learning engineer, it's not the people that collected the data, it's not the it's it's society as a whole that must take a certain like position where it's like okay, we we must change the rules of the game, you know. It's not the players that are at fault. It's the rules of the game, right? And I think there's a whole bunch of philosophical discussions that can be done on that in the sense that, and that's why I think it's important when we discuss these things, like there's, there's a technical definitions for things that can get kind of, uh, you know, very iffy with all the gray areas in between. And then there's like the humanist perspective, you know, because it's important to bring in uh, sociologists in discussions and if, if, if as, um, psychologists in discussions that involve people, I think it's not just a question of, okay, what do I think? Because as, as a machine learning engineer, I might have a perspective uh, that I will inject into the model because the model, like we think it only makes one decision at the very end, but all the decisions I made in building, in training that model from what data I use to what modeling method I use, everything that kind of somehow that seeps in and that becomes that decision. So it it starts early on. And in precisely, I think one of the biggest blind spots in the is in the data generation, in the data collection process, which is not being seen. Because data connects to this truth that it's supposed to kind of connect to. But if that truth is biased to begin with, then we have a bigger problem. So then we we must adjust the the the, the model to be to in, in, correct that bias. Uh, we can't just be irresponsibly just rely on the data, because that's that's kind of uh, something that a lot of machine learning engineers aren't aware about. They think okay, the data tells me that you know the data reflects that truth. Whatever it is I'm trying to do, the data is there. The data cannot lie. And, and maybe the, the data is true, but the data might be unfair, other, you know, nonetheless. So like as a society, we have to have the discussion. What, what truly is the definition you know, of, of fair? 
you know, what are the, you know, and, and maybe that's informed more by outcomes than by procedures, you know, uh, how should we measure both? Because no matter how we train a model, it's never going to be perfect, right? So there's, there's a trade-off we must adjust, you know, because at the end of the day, we're not trying to, I mean, it would be impossible to make a perfect one, but what we're trying to do is something that, that does a better job than a human, you know? Or, or one that at least does, you know, something very simple, which is models don't have to say yes or no. They don't have to, you know, actually even predict something. They could say, okay, like this is too close to call. Let's just say this is a maybe and, and, and ask a human to answer this for us, right? It, but in, in, the, in the hopes of creating, you know, maximizing efficiency, we're getting rid of all this nuance, which is the sense that, like, say my model predicts 51% high risk, it, you know, it's already high risk, you know, and we forget it's only 51%. It's only like 1% over the threshold. That's nothing. Like, so let's, let's try to disentangle that and understand, like, how, how do we capture that nuance and make the most of it? How do we make things more robust um, and, and, uh, and that way make better decisions? Um, let's put that into a context and talk about a real life case that you talked about in your book. Um, I think you've already seen the coded bias movie. And one of the assertions of um, the primary proponent of um, the documentary is the white mask detection problem, uh, where um, so African American um, people will not be detected by the software um, or the algorithm they're talking about uh, unless they have a white mask. And, and their assertion is that you know these models are trained predominantly on white males and uh, white females or people of lighter color. And um, I think like all um, typical American documentary in their um, movies, um, there's more drama and propaganda to that than the reality to that. Uh, for example, the only solution and the easy solution for that would be to get more data from people of diverse population and minorities and, and possibly global data to make it more fair. Why the huge buzz about uh, how models are unfair? I mean, I do understand there are political motives of that also, because you got to do something to be on TV, but what other than that? Well, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. You know, you're talking about coded bias. Yeah, um, yeah I, I do, I do believe that. Yeah, there there is an easy solution to that problem, which is adding more people, uh, more more faces. Uh, but but the, still, there has to be a recognition, you know, of of you know what what is it trying to represent? You know, what is it for? Is it for surveillance? Is it for, uh, you know, yeah, but like, I think uh, the more interesting look is that let's flip the question and think of it from the perspective of the opposite side. So if you are someone in the IBM and you're trying to create a, a computer vision algorithm for face detection for allowing people to come in um, to the security without human supervision and the predominant employees that you have, uh, like the predominant race for them as like white male or white females. Well, let's assume there's a place where there's no not much diverse. If that training data set is pulled um, by the team and you know put on movie as a representative of all uh, computer vision algorithms, that I think that's cherry picking and that's not correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the movie does present some cases in which like London is a very diverse city. And they're using computer vision that is very inaccurate in London, and and it it doesn't really um, capture like all the different kinds of faces you would see in London, you know. But say you're you're trying to do one for a particular office, and like 99% of your people are white. Yeah, I mean you you would ideally use a a um, a model that represented that group. But then you have to make sure that that model is not used elsewhere. You know, I think you have the, to... the primary assertion of um, the movie and the, the uh, thing that we're trying to focus here on is that um, there's a bias in algorithm. And I don't see how it, it's a bias if there is less training data and if there is someone who's actually making the data. I think what you probably alluded 
to is the fact that if you're using that information to make decisions that are not fair to a certain ethnic group, that would be something that I can agree on. But as for the bias, um, I just, I'm trying to understand how did that bias, is it from that a collection perspective point of view? Is it from the machine learning yeah. perspective view? Is it the decision-making perspective? I mean, how is that bias? It's biased because the, the people that collected the data and decided to use it weren't aware, they, they didn't take into account representation. Like Yes, but even say, if that's uh, true, if the, that's working for their specific um, small use case, why do they have to make it uh, fair if they don't have any African-American or let's say Asian or let's say Australian people? Well, we're, we're, we're talking here, like for instance, like what the movie talks about are, are like big companies that that actually sell their models or provide their models to other companies. So we're talking about like all these companies, Amazon, Google, they all have computer vision models for detecting human faces. And they're well aware that these models aren't used like specifically for small use cases. I mean, they're not used like for like only companies in, the, in, in Nebraska, you know, they know they're used like throughout the world. So they, it's, it's their responsibility to either highlight, no, this is only to be used with these ethnic groups in these places, fine. Or this was only trained. It's their responsibility to actually include as many faces as possible and to correct. Like if they're taking the faces from the internet, it's a painstaking process because who knows, maybe on the internet, there's like more kinds of, you know, there's more representation from gun group for another. It's a painstaking process, but someone should label them and say, okay, well, we're going to make sure that they're the representative of the world population, you know, or at the very least kind of the population we wanted to represent and tell people, this is the, this is a model for this. It's only to be used in Scandinavia, you know, nowhere else. Oh, fine. Uh, you know, or maybe I'm, 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 I'm being unjust to Scandinavia because there's, no, you are there's actually. a I growing mean, population. Think, there's speak? a growing population of, of, of other people in Scandinavia as well. But what I'm saying is like they, they have a responsibility to do so. Um, like I think something that is, that is missed from the machine learning process is, is data provenance. And it's really important to highlight the data provenance when you build a model, uh, you know, like because that kind of informs people what the model can be used for. So if, if, if I make a model on, on like, even if it's voices and I say, okay, this, this was only trained on this kind of voice from this region or these dialects, like nobody will think of using it elsewhere. But if I, I just call the, you know, it's a, it's a model to detect, uh, you know, if someone is soprano or, you know, a uh, contralto or something, and they don't know if it's only males or females are used more males and females, they, they might use it for one use case it was never meant for. So um, I, I think, I think one, of the use cases, one of the use cases, um, let's expand the discussion um, and you need to speak um, on their behalf or let's say on their side. Um, one of the use cases that became a huge problem was uh, one of the Kiwi citizens um, from a Chinese origin who went to the um, airport and the system couldn't detect um, his face and kept giving um, the instruction back that, you know, you have to open your eyes. And, you know, if you're you know, a Chinese face, you know, your eyes are a little squinted in comparison to other people. Let's say the model um, perceives it that way. And that can be a huge problem for someone who's, you know, getting late to their flight and, you know, they need to pass through security. So these are the situations where probably they, they have a very good point that um, model needs to be more fair and inclusive so that, you know, no people are left behind or they're uh, discomfort, they have the discomfort of, you know, going through all the additional security um, and chips. Uh, but I guess we can agree on the fact that um, the, the, the data provenance is a huge um, step which uh, people should be more focused on um, instead of model uh, process. Because model in general works, uh, it doesn't discriminate through the process, uh, but you know the data itself can be quite discriminating. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think like models I mean, maybe the model building process, but it's not like the models are inherently discriminatory. It's it's the data that's used. It's the is the decisions that were made throughout the the process that were made by people. Like it, it's not like I, I can tell you, oh, like uh, don't use logistic regression. It's 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 inherently discriminatory. No, it, it might have 
it, it, it might be more tended, it, it might be worse at generalization than say another model, but it's, it's not inherently biased. It's just, it, it, you're, you, you as a practitioner are supposed to decide what modeling class to use, what data to use, what features to use within that data, you know, how to prepare your data, that's your job, right? And, and that, in, in that job, you're making decisions that, affect, that make, whether you like it or not, can make the model more, more discriminatory or not. And, and I think it's also up to that practitioner to look at the outcomes and kind of analyze the, 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 risk, the outcomes in, risk, in accordance to the groups that are within that uh, you know, data set, whether that's people or in my case, plants, you know, there could be discrimination there, there could be bias. And, and, um, and that, that is also your responsibility as a practitioner. Of course, like you're not so where that stops is the data. Someone might have given you the data, and you might have trusted where that data came from, and that that's no longer your issue uh, as the practitioner. Um, so, obviously, data prominence—that's where it, it becomes a big issue. But you have to, you also have it has to be part of the workflow to assess all these different things, uh, because otherwise they can have consequences. And yeah, maybe they're small, maybe they're huge, you know, maybe they affect people, maybe they don't. Um, but um, saying that's not part of the process is, is, is just leaving it all up to chance. And, uh, you know, it, I, I, I say it's like, um, you know, like learning to fly only when it's sunny. And then when it gets cloudy, then your, 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 your model's not going to work. So it, it all connects to generalization, uh, very much so like where we were saying about bias, if, if your model is discriminatory towards uh, black people and your model never sees black people, then you'll never know it's discriminatory and you'll never, it, it, it won't matter, you know? But uh, as soon as that happens, then, then you have a problem. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I guess a lot of it connected also is that what's the penalty or like real life risk of um, using that model um, in, giving rewards and punishments based on that. But let's move on to um, fixing the problem, um, which is probably the most a more constructive approach of um, how we deal things. And you talk about in your book about uh, different possible ways that we could uh, make data more equitable and fair. And one of the new techniques, at least for the um, convolution network, neural networks um, problems um, or based models, is that you could always use the data augmentation to create instances of um, samples that are not there. And then once mm -hmm. you have the larger data, then you can use nonlinear functions like neural networks um, for that and have different activations. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how um, precise is that technique for um, using in um, social situations where we could augment data just to see if um, any changes to the data set uh, would make it more fair or our predictions more accurate in social situations you're saying in 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 structured data i um, mean images can also be converted to structural data so yeah so um you know yeah. in structural data collected through um and surveys um and um, demographic data and psychographic data and things like that well strangely it's 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 easy for us to augment images because of the nature of images you know like, uh, but it's it's a lot harder with with tabular data sets. Uh, what you can do, and and I don't necessarily recommend it unless you have very little amount of data, or you it's almost easier to get more samples. You know, from uh, you know, say you collected surveys and you're you're trying that, and just collect more or collect them from a different group. You know. Um, uh, another exercise is, 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 is dealing from it from a counterfactual standpoint and, and seeing what changes near the decision line on the other end um, and, 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 and play around with that. Um, also, as far as we're talking about robustness, which is something you do with data augmentation and see what happens when you inject noise into the data. And that's a very interesting experiment and it's very similar to what you would do with counterfactuals. So, I, I play around with those things. Um, 
surveys is an interesting problem because surveys uh, like are very tricky because you you ask you ask people questions and I've done this before for my startup. Uh, you know, there's a process called uh, product market fit, and so you survey a lot of people uh, to figure out what they think about your product. Um, but how you ask those questions is critical because you ask them a certain way, you're already leading them to give you the answer you want. So you, you kind of have to try all these, and you would know this as someone in psychology, you have to trick them you know, to give you an on, honest answer. So it's really important when you're doing surveys to, to understand the data collection process and understand that one question led after the other. Uh, because they might have, uh, they, they can get tired throughout the questionnaire. They can, they can, they can kind of understand, oh, this, this is where they're going. So I don't want to appear as unfriendly. So I'm going to say this other thing. So like designing that is very, very tricky. And um, I, I'm almost pay, more inclined to pay more attention into how the survey was constructed, how, you know, came up about with the decisions of making you know, the data collection process and the process itself. Something super interesting to do with surveys is, is hypothesis testing. I said like test, test distributions of things and, and, and run them through causal modeling to see like if someone answers this, does this mean this? And so you're trying, it's even seeing things even more through a lens of kind of factuals. Um, and um, it's, it's not at all like uh, the answer I would give with a with a uh, an, an image based data data set, you know. Um, but I I think that's that's a way to assess um, pretty much the quality of a data set is to understand if there is more than correlations, like a, a causal progression in the responses people did, you know. What what makes a person more likely to answer this if they already answered that? Um, so there's a lot of interesting questions you could gauge from that. I think one of the problems with this approach is um, when you are too biased to optimize a certain metric. I was talking to Luis Serrano who was on our show a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. who worked at Google, and um, he was yeah. exactly working on this algorithm to optimize the view time. And that necessarily isn't going to give you um, a fair playing field if you already know what you want to get optimized by hook or crook. Um, and that means that um, you would have to um, tilt um, the questionnaires, or let's say um, in YouTube's case, the uh, designing of um, the first page that users will say based on their demographics or psychographics, um, attractive thumbnails and things like this, do whatever you want to do to optimize um, the uh, watch time. And I was just wondering, there are not only biases um, in terms of uh, the data and how you put that uh, into the process and the results, but also in our cognitive biases in designing what you want to see um, as the result and not what really is. But maybe people just don't want to see a particular video, but there are 150 ways you can, um, you know, present that information to them so that they're kind of uh, have to watch that or you know that probably is their only option yeah like certainly from from a predictive standpoint it is completely possible based on past behavior uh, within like a closed system like it is within youtube to actually come across with all the signals that will tell you this person is most likely to watch this video and, 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 and more likely than not, you'll be fairly accurate. You know, it might not be like the number one video they would want to watch, uh, watch next, but it might be like the, you know, number three or number four. You know, it, it's, it's not, could, if, if the, you have enough data about this person, it's likely you'll get it right. If not, you go with, uh, you know, the, the expected value. You know, in other words, you get, you know, the most popular videos within that region and you might come close to it. You know, so um, what I'm saying is from a predictive standpoint, it's, it's not a mystery to, to, to harness this predictive power use, used only through correlations uh, that you find in the data. And, uh, but what worries me is that here we're confounding 
uh, explanatory power and predictive power. And, and so like you could, you could necessarily find those correlations, but you wouldn't understand you know, why they, they make sense, uh, why uh, a person is more, more uh, conducive to one thing or another. And when it fails, when that whole process fails, like you, you don't engage the person, they don't want, you wouldn't know why. I mean, they have other things, you know, outside of that bubble of YouTube, like they have a life and, and, and you, you're not aware of that. Of course, there's a lot of elements you're not aware of when you build a model like this. So I, I think, I, I don't know if, if this answers your question because I'm it does not actually, sure. and it actually engenders a question which is more interesting. Uh, I was watching a, a video, I think it was split scaling an interview with Eric Schmidt at Google, and uh, he was talking about the fact um, that you know Google at some point um, has because you know these all big companies have sh shared data with each other. At some point, mm -hmm. they become so good at it that you know they will predict what this person is going to date today, um, like a couple of hours ago, a couple of hours in the future, in the evening, and things like this. And that's not something that they can openly publicly discuss because first, that's going to be against the um, privacy laws. Second, it's going to scare a lot of people. Um, but you know these that's a benefit when you when you watch YouTube videos and you know find one of the things. Um, which is very interesting and um, at our company side also we do a lot of behavioral work and uh, we have found out that people are not generally very different from each other when it comes to behavior they're always like their friend and family and you know um where does the same feather flock together um on average you know if you're buying something your friend's going to see you and you're going to buy the same thing and you know um, next Facebook ad can tell your third friend that you know two of your friends already bought this um shoes and if that's not too expensive you know, he or she's more likely going to buy that. And one of the solutions for that problem that you propose in your book, and we use that site also, uh, which are the shaft values, um, originally coming from, uh, coming from coalitional game theory. And you talk about different explainers, like tree explainer and a deep explainer for um, the deep neural networks. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, yeah, like one of the reasons I like SHAP and, um, I mean, it's by no means like the only um, explainer there is, the only uh, method there is, is, well, it first you can use it for global and local explanations. Also, it, it is, even though each explainer individually is not, um, you know, model agnostic, altogether, all of them are model agnostic. So uh, it, it's very versatile in that sense. But most importantly, the, the biggest reason is like, there, there are mathematical properties it complies to, which is not the case for every explainer, you know, um, ex every explainer, every method. There's a lot of methods out there that don't have these tried and proven mathematical properties. Where SHAP fails, as well as a lot of them are, do is in the fact that it's stochastic in nature. It's a permutation-based me method. So you have to run it enough times like you would with any Monte Carlo method to, to get a good sense that it is what you think it is, that the results are, you know, um, that they, they, they mean what you think it means or what it tells you it means. So you, you need to, you know, spin the wheel as many times to, to get to a, a, a very, um, you know, uh, I guess, relevant result. So I, I think, um, it has that it has many pros and and that's why i i use it in many chapters um because uh it's it's also one of my favorite things is the fact that i can also get um interaction chap values and and you can only do that with decision trees um unfortunately but uh, it's it's something people don't know enough of and i encourage them to use that because it's it's far better than using like the intrinsic um importance values that are derived from the tree itself because at least they're grounded in something uh that is more or less always the same depending on how many times i said i said you 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 spin the 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 slot machine because it is a slot machine you know um yeah um just that's exactly why um i really love the chapter um reading about that because i read a lot of books and you know very few um, people talk about that um and I guess a lot of people have their good reasons uh, for not using that, uh, especially when it comes to big data. Uh, one of the problems with SHAP is that it's immensely computational uh, greedy. Um, it takes a lot of competition to actually 
um, like you said, you know, you have to run it multiple times. Uh, on top of that, um, even with that, you have to make some uh, smart statistical adjustments um, and choices to eliminate some of the computational um, intensive uh, processes or, or mathematics. So tell us a little bit about more about that, that why um, people um, tend not to use that on big data. Mm, yeah, that, that would be the reason. Like everything, it is computational expensive. I mean, you think it would have to be, you know, like anything that tried to explain what, what a feature, uh, how a feature is more important in model than another one. I mean, um, you know, as long as it, it kind of had to uh, subscribe to certain like mathematical properties that made it rigorous, it would have to be like all the methods that that comply with certain properties, be it sensitivity analysis, be it integrated gradients, be it SHAP, like all these methods are computational expen expensive on purpose. I mean, it's, it's just part of their nature. They have to connect every feature to other features, group them up together and do that. Well, in the case of integrated gradients, it's different, but what I'm saying is it, it does take a lot of different tries to, to derive these insights and be able to place them in an order um, that, that, that you can you know, place a certain level of trust in. Um, so I, I think that's what stops people from using it. But honestly, I think more than that, because there's, there's quite a bit of computation uh, available. I mean, some, I would say, I would dare to say most models take more computation than it does to actually derive the SHAP values. That being said, unless you, you, you did the SHAP values to like the maximum possible of, of, uh, of uh, fidelity you could have, you wouldn't do that. You, you, would, you would probably uh, take a sample for background data. You would, you would limit it a bit, but it would still be less computation than 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 training, uh, uh, you know, model on big data. Uh, I would, I would think most of the time that would be the case. I think the main reason people don't use it is because they're not aware about it, or they're not aware about its importance. They think, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how the model arrives to a decision. The important thing is that, hey, I got 99% accuracy, or you know, I got like 0.5% RMSE. No, no, 0 0.5 RMSE. Like that's what's going to matter to them. And, and that's what they communicate to the stakeholders. The stakeholders don't care what features were used uh, most of the time. So, um, and which ones were important. I mean, they might care about that in, during the feature selection process, but that's another problem. Feature selection processes usually work with data on itself. They don't deal with the model. They're just dealing with the data, looking for correlations in the data or, or some more sophisticated statistical method, but they don't, they don't work with a model. And I, I think that's a mistake. I think you can, you can fit a model as long as it's not like a, a thousand features, you can fit and, and uh, too much data to work with. You can fit the model with all the data, then progressively use something like SHAP to, to decide on them. Um, that's that's a perfectly valid approach, and it probably be it yield better results. It all depends on the data. Um, of course, <laughs> take that with a grain of salt because it's going to depend a lot on the data. Uh, but I I think modeling should be introduced early on in the process. It can be used for uh, you know completely exploratory reasons. It, it doesn't have to be used once you've pretty much decided. Okay, I, I had originally these 500 features. I brought it down to 10. Right, and you brought it down to ten, strictly looking at you know Pearson's correlation. That's silly. You know why would you do that? Uh, are you kind of assuming that all the data is linear, um, which is rarely the case? You know all the relationships are linear. That um, that would be a, a, a silly approach to move. It would be better to bring modeling and SHAP and Lime and all the methods early on in the process. Um. Let's assume Tesla is running a model um, which requires 4,000 GPUs working simultaneously for a month to create a world-class model. Or just talk about mm. OpenAI's GPT-3 and things like this. On top of that, you're asking them to run CHAP with exactly the same computational power for over a month. And now think of it from a business perspective. And for me, it's a bad marriage. 
And this is why, you know, people are falling out of love with um, these shab wallets. I mean, why I explained it, if it's working fine for us, you know, cars working just great, you know, the sales are through the ro to ro rooftop. So why bother? No, no. I mean, I'm like, don't get me wrong. It depends. I'm not, on you know, I'm just trying to give you a business perspective, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah. Like if, if why if I, I were into, I'm, I'm just telling you, if, if that were the case, like there's a lot of high stakes. And they might not relate to the entire data. Like, like, um, like Tesla might have thousands of models working in conjunction to derive a decision. And some of them are high stakes, others are not. Some, you know, some just deal with you know, sensors from, from the car itself. And, and there's no reason to question them. There's no reason to think they're biased. There's no reason to anything. You just put some safeguards to make the, the sensors are working and that's completely mechanical, you know? And then there's other stuff that has to be with the computer vision of the, the or, or has to do with the LIDAR, all right? And, and so maybe you pick and choose certain parts and you explore them through SHAP. You don't take the entire thing and, and kind of dissect everything. You just take the parts that it, it, it really, really matters to see exactly what the model's seeing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and maybe SHAP isn't the answer. Maybe you, you get even better results through, you know, some other method, you know, you, maybe you get better results through set using some, you know, um, segmentation on the, on the LIDAR image first, and then pre-processing in a certain way. And then, and then, and then using some completely like algorithmic safeguard to make sure that's correct. But what I'm saying is like, there is an importance to look through the explanation so that whenever your model sees, you know, like something that, you know, like say you train it to detect pedestrians and never you occurred on your, in your mind that, you know, there'd be, you know, someday someone crossing the street that doesn't look like a pedestrian. They have, I don't know, like a, a costume on or something. <laughs> um, so like, does it, does it matter to kind of, you're not going to know that, but it does matter to you to see exactly in every case, in as many cases as possible, what does the model see? What, why, why does it think a pedestrian is a pedestrian? Why does it not? You know, um, you know, not that it's necessarily going to crash against them, but there might be some things that it takes into account. If it's a pedestrian, it might, you know, it might just break like that, right? And, and passengers won't like that unless there's like a, a high likelihood that it is a pedestrian, right? Um, for, for all you know, it could be anything else. So like, I, this is, might be a silly example, but I think if whatever it is you're building, you, you can't rely on predictive power alone. You have to guide some to some degree with explanations. It, it'll, it will have a cost, no doubt, computationally, but it's worthwhile because you just make the bottle more robust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and everybody wants robust models, you know? I think it's just, uh, you know, like you, you take it all the way to 99% accurate or 99.9 .9 and you think, okay, that's it. Um, but that's in the lab, in the real world, you know, there'll be things you don't expect it to have. And obviously the guys at Tesla know this, which is why they, they, they have test cards running around all the place. They know that that's the case. They know the real world is different than the lab. So that's why they do that. And that's good. But this isn't about Tesla. This is about every, you know, like everyday company that has their, that are building models today and, and don't have the, the, the know-how or the resources of Tesla and, and, and are completely unaware of these problems. You know, because I'm pretty sure engineers in Tesla are, are, are using explanations on their models, whether it's SHAP or not, it, they are. <laughs> so apart from SHAP, um, what options are out there in the dating pools so that we can make up? Uh, dating pools? Well, we were talking about, you know, SHAP divorce, and you know, now we have another dating pool to find a new partner to be explained, uh, explaining uh, the uh, data set. Well, but let's put it that way. Um, you were, you also talked about Lime and other options that we could use uh, apart from SHAP to explain data. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, they're 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 a ton. And as far as computer vision models go, they they they, they multiply like bunnies. You know, like there's there's hundreds of them. You know, some. What are your favorites? Uh, yeah, uh, I I like integrated gradients a lot because I think it it it. I, I, I think it's grounded on, on integral calculus. It's, it's, it's very well studied. There's a lot of them that are, you know, tend to work like, you know, like you grad smooth and are smooth grad and smooth grad plus plus and, and, and so many others and eigen grad and you could go on and on with all the grads, but they don't have that level of, of, of fidelity that you can get with um, integrated gradients. There's of course people that say, no, you can't get that with integrated gradients because they, they have this blind spot. But that's always gonna be the case, which is why in my book, in particular that chapter, I'd say, don't rely on a single method, you know, uh, because they're, they're, they're not perfect. Like they all have their, their, their different focus. They, and, and one of the, the issues with, with images in particular is that even for integrated gradients has the baseline, you know, it has, and, and that's really important. It, it doesn't, you have to calibrate that to your purpose because if your baseline is saying, okay, my baseline is an image that's completely black, right? And so you're, you're parting from that assumption that you, 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 you um, anything over black, you know, as you graduate, from that image uh, is more and more salient. You know, in other words, the pixel become lighter and lighter, and and that's what you're measuring with the integrals, like uh, or the approximations of them. Like you, that by itself is a tiny bias in the sense that, like, what if what you're measuring is best identified as as like white being the absence of your features, not black. The absence of your features or some other color so like there's always things to watch out for with these methods whether it is the baseline or there's the number of steps or something um and so none of them are like non-parametric and none of them even when they are when you put the per perfect parameters are going to be perfect so um i i suggest even in all use cases, you, you you don't settle for one method, which is why, like I, I even in one of the chapters I use SHAP, I also use Lime, and I construct, uh, I, I, I I talk about their pros and the cons. I contrast them um, because you know there are cases in which you would prefer, and even even within Lime, there's there's other alternatives to Lime. You know, there's there's a method called DLime, which is like Lime, but it's a different algorithm and, and you could go on and on. Um, the book doesn't go into like, it, it goes into only like a, per, a percentage, uh, perhaps what you would call the most popular methods, but there's like dozens of times more methods than the ones described in the book. And, and that's the thing, like uh, I think a lot of them might, might depend on your use case. Like now there's more, there's more methods for transformers just this year, like a new library for explaining transformers came out loud, you know, and that's not mentioned in the book because it's, it's brand new, you know, um, and there's a new method that came about from uh, Microsoft for error analysis, which is a much needed like a uh, new thing, a new way of approaching a problem, which is okay, like, it's, it falls into what I was discussing before. Even when you have the highest accuracy you could dream of, it still makes sense to figure out why you, why you misclassified or why you got some errors, uh, just to understand where are the errors, because it's not like you're 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 ever going to make it a hundred percent, but you you could still learn from that to improve upon it, and and so that it also is, you also find in instances where you think it's right, but it's actually wrong because it's right for the wrong reasons. Um, and and that's, that's an important lesson to learn because uh, especially in cases where you don't have an, a, enough examples, you could be entirely wrong for the right reasons. 
Um, yeah, I'm sure it's very hard to explain to C-suite um, you know, employees um, how this works because they think you know the process of creativity and um, these great tools is linear, which is not. So it goes like almost like ACG um, in real life. Uh, but let's talk about yeah. a situation just like Tesla, but with the, uh, the huge um, stake in comparison to Tesla, where you know the casualty is 100%, which is the airlines. You talk about in your book about high stake systems and their interoperability, like traffic alert and collision avoidance system, TCAS yeah. for pilots. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lack of fairness um, here uh, is probably uh, not something that makes sense because there is no fairness in terms of uh, explainability. But the the casualty count is 100%. So if you mess this up and it's not like Tesla, you might have a collision with a pedestrian or something and you know you might survive, but you know in the air, the chances are 0%. And I'm just wondering, um, we, you also talk about in your book about a um, possible um, ransom attack or adversarial attack where you know, actually just inject something and you know, remove the lanes in Tesla system um, in lead hour or something that might you know throw the system off. If that actually happens in the airline systems, you know the the risks are huge. How do you see the interpretability of these systems, and what should be done um, to improve them? Well, like the reason, like the book, and it's well discussed in literature. Actually, I didn't I didn't come with this idea of uh, it's it's in one of the papers um, that I uh, I cited as a source for that chapter. Um, that example of air, uh, traffic collisions systems. And that's the system that just makes sure that planes don't collide against each other, right? Um, there is, the important thing is even though airways are pretty congested, especially over the Atlantic, um, like these, these uh, the planes, they're, they're at the moment, it's not like it is in the roads in the sense that they're, they're not meant to be even remotely close to each other, right? So uh, whenever they get close to each other, these systems that, that I think work underlyingly with radar are very simple by design. They're meant to be very straightforward and, and, and just make sure that the planes avoid a collision. Of course, like the chances of two planes kind of getting that close to each other are, are very slim to begin with. So it doesn't even fathom the possibility of, you know, them avoiding each other and by chance hitting other planes, you know? So- How is that possible? Did the whole plane just ram into uh, World Trade Towers? I mean, was it um, a case of uh, misguidedness or was it like a takeover? Uh, it was a takeover. Obviously there was some override to the system and how come um, and I don't the, think the, I don't, the people detected that uh, in time? No, and also also there's another thing, which is that this is for planes to crash against each other. It's not for a plane to crash against another object. Well, no, but the, the technical right? point here is that if it's veering off of its track, so somebody should notice that, you know, that's an anomaly, no? Mm. Yeah, the air traffic control system. Yeah, like the people, people are looking at these systems and they must have, must have noticed it. I mean, I'm, and they probably, I mean, it's simple I'm pipelines, not... it flags the anomaly, but how how come it's happened? The whole you know, plane just got off of the track. No one noticed until it bumped into a huge tower. <laughs> well, because there, it, it wasn't like when, when you discuss the flight path, it's not like it was like, uh, you know, 10 kilometers off its flight path like that the World Trade Center was only, you know, relatively speaking, a, a small distance from there. So it, it didn't, it didn't have to veer long enough for, for, you know, anybody be able to respond. That's the problem, like the airport, you know, that it came from, which I think was JFK, and, 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 uh, and they actually made sure that the plane that the, it's, it wasn't a plane gearing towards Europe. It was going to one towards, I, I don't know if California or someone in that direction. So it was going west in that in that area. So it only veered off. Uh, but you know, the, the established story is that, you know, the, the communication was dropped way before, um, you know, it actually bumped that's in the That's possible. That's possible. But what I'm saying isn't it, it a huge flag? Like they had enough time. They didn't have enough time to have, you know, uh, fighter plate planes intercept the the plane. They didn't have enough time to respond in that sense. You know, like these days, you could 
and and um, in the book doesn't discuss this, but you, you could certainly have a model look at you know like the real time radar information and assist. And these probably exist. I don't know if they do. And assist uh, the air traffic control. And well, yeah, and if something air, was yeah. off, and it was going near civilian uh, building, you know, civilian targets. I mean, it could certainly, or even military, could have some kind of response immediately, automatically. Uh, but the, the book doesn't discuss that. What it no, I mean, the point of asking the question is that, you know, uh, from a technical perspective, um, which is that, you know, systems should have flagged it way before it actually veered off. And I have read, you know, in Bloomberg the other day, I'm not exactly remember the names. So there, there's this huge company and it was held for ransom um, and had to pay like what, $5 billion or something transferred over uh, Bitcoin to get the system back. It was a huge, uh, I, I just... I don't have the name on top of my head. And if that could happen to the, you know, one of the most secure um, you know, industries, a government um, organization or things like that, why, I mean, what is the possibility it wouldn't happen to high stick um, scenarios like that? Well, yeah, but that's, that's uh, to a certain extent is IT security, um, you know, which obviously there's, there's there's machine learning models that could protect them from things like that, and 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 then there's all the other things that are far trickier than IT security, and I'm I'm talking hacking into humans, you know, and and people know how to exploit these systems. I mean, you can protect your IT systems all you want, but you know, someone uh, that works for you getting drunk in a bar and having their 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 card swiped you know, from the workplace or something like that. Yeah, that is, that is something that's going to happen. So like, there are ways around it, but they're going to take a little bit of invasion of privacy. Like um, if a company really, you know, if a company really wants to secure its system, it could use like, uh, you know, like all kinds of uh, uh, bio, biometrics to make sure that nobody comes in, you know, like by no means. Like even if, even if they, and, and they could, they could come up with all these far-fetched plausible possibilities, depending on what they're safeguarding, like, you know, someone like cutting off the thumb of, of an employee and coming with the thumb, you know, <laughs> um, things like that, you know, making sure that can't happen either, you know, like, so even in those cases, you know, there, there, there might be a still way in, but what I'm, what I'm saying is like, Machine learning isn't always the answer, and 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 when it is, I, I I would tend to go through like the simpler solutions that tackle like specific problems, rather than something that tackles the whole thing because it's just gonna it's it's gonna become more complicated, and you're always gonna find use cases which you can't explain through other means. So, in 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 security, high stakes security circumstances, I think a combination between humans and machines would yield better results than machines by themselves. And that's of course almost um, always true. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what do you do when you are not working on trap and lime and these complicated issues. You, you play electric bass and guitar, I believe. Uh, what are you, um, what kind of music are you into? Is it rock, blues, uh, yeah, hip hop? I'm, yeah, all, all that. Um, I, I've, I enjoy all kinds of music from, um, you know, like classical to blues, to R&B, to rock. The, the, what would, you, what all, all would you the mentioned. three favorites would be? Uh, well, I, 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 I grew up listening to a lot of rock. So I would say, I have to say it's-, it's, it's Someone uh, in particular? Uh, <laughs> um, well, um, Led Zeppelin, um, you okay. know, Radiohead, um, you know, like- uh, Usual suspects. Beatles. What? The usual suspects. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, Were you the rhythm guy or the lead guy? Because I could never get a hang of lead. I don't know. I have just too big of a finger uh, for lead. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I never, I actually never played in a band. <laughs> oh, I mean, you I, could just play at home. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I learned to play just like, uh, you know, whatever part. Yeah, okay. when, when, I, when I learned bass. The interesting part is that you talk about in your book um, and actually use the data set for um, the personality and childbirth. And I was recently talking to 
um, the chief science officer of Hogan Assessment, which is the largest workplace assessment and company in the world about um, the the same topic. And I was just wondering, uh, are you the first um, born also or do you have siblings? I'm the second born, yeah. I am. Um, so yeah. according to research, slower and <laughs> uh, take more time to uh, figure out things. But I was just wondering, what's your take on uh, the uh, topic itself? It's very interesting because I believe there's an element of truth to that. You know, the firstborn child are more conscientious just in general um, and more um, thorough in particular than the younger ones. They tend to be more flashy and colorful. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, you know, the strangest thing when you, and, and I looked at this, uh, you know, like all the academic literature in, in, in psychology about this, and there's so much debate, and, and there's, there tends to be more people in the camp of no, it's not possible, there's, there's, there's no relation than there is in the camp of yes, but intuitively, we're like, yeah, I, I do see connections, so I'm not sure, are we crazy, is this kind of some kind of astrology thing? We're tricking ourselves into thinking it's true and it's really not. Um, I I think it's just the signals are are too varied to see in some like really specific questions. It's not like there's one question that tells you all well, you you know like uh, for for it to work questionnaire wise you would have to have like hundreds of questions probably in uh, testing every single option for it to be somewhat accurate. But we as humans, we meet someone and just with, with a few signals we manage to capture. This seems like a firstborn, you know? And why is that? Why is it so much easier for us? Uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, probably there, there's a certain element of culture in it. You know, it, it really much depends where we are, although there's some commonalities. And it also, there's, there's also a question of, you know, like, we can dissect like from even not a question just s capture some nuance from a tiny interaction and and find something meaningful in it without even knowing it which is kind of amazing but uh it, it does it does it do wonder how how can psychologists uh you know that are so close to that from you know so close to that field be able to are are, are they better perhaps in understanding these things than, than, than the common person, or are they worse because they know so much? <laughs> I think you know, a lot of intuition is probably psychology. I mean, we didn't have that name before um, you know, early experiments in the 18th century. People just used to believe in tried and tested, you know, uh, biblical uh, lessons and uh, folk wisdom. But you know, then we kind of made it a um, discipline and started um, studying that in, in university. And I was just wondering, does that a hypothesis actually um, has some accuracy in your experiment. I mean, how's your elder brother or sister look like? Yeah, they they they're a little better. <laughs> my older brother, my older brother is 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 quite bossy. Yes. <laughs> okay. I mean, um, the word I was looking yeah. for was, I mean, you know, faster and quicker, and, and you know, more IQ. But you would call it bossy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he has some elements. Um, yeah. No, I think we're 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 all. I mean, we all have our, it's just in, in terms of intelligence, I think we're, we're all the same. We're, 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 um, we're all in our own fields, um, know about, you know, our things and, and have our, our fortes, if you will. Yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's not a kind of a, um, you know, win-lose competition, I guess. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, um, for the love of fairness, I guess, uh, we have to talk about both sides uh, in debate of transparency, accountability, and uh, responsibility when it comes to AI. And uh, one of the things that I've marked noticed um, in all these um, um, heavily um, sentimental uh, documentaries and movies about um, AI ethics um, is the fact that it only um, enlarges um, one side of the picture, which is the um, side of the oppressed without actually talking about the other side and what's technically possible or not. For example, reverse discrimination um, in algorithm could be a thing also. For example, um, it, social justice warriors talk a lot about um, you know, the wage gap, which is by the way a myth and there's no scientific evidence for that. Um, they forget to tend conveniently about the child custody, which is always goes with the uh, woman. 
men in the jail are the more uh, dominant uh, gender in the jails. Uh, women are sentenced uh, officially 63% less than men. Um, and uh, U.S. being uh, the prison of the world, um, because there are more incarcerated people than any other place in the world. Do you also think that uh, you know these the, the reverse and discrimination is a fact also, and algorithms can actually um, do something to minimize some of those effects? Well, there's there's obviously societal issues and societal uh, circumstances that make one group more prone to certain kind of behavior than another. Um, yeah, so I, I think in that sense, it depends what you consider fairness to be. Like um, men are more prone. I don't know if it's in our nature to, to, to engage more in, in criminal activity or yeah, simply the how circumstances. How do you explain the fact, uh, for example? There, simply there... the circumstance. I, I would leave those questions more to someone that, that studies that particular field. I think it might be a combination of both. There's a report me. that I was about to cite, which is from the uh, University of uh, Michigan Law Department um, yeah. by Professor Starr, in which it goes that you know women are twice as likely to avoid incarceration if convicted, mm -hmm. and men get um, convicted 63% more time. It's not to assume that you know women are totally innocent, just like a Angel Beach has no capacity of evil doing or you know gossiping or things like this. But the problem with society itself um, undermines the role of uh, women in evil acts um, in on the same level, level playing field as men. Uh, for example, they've already made sure that you know, after controlling the arrest offense and criminal history and the prior char characteristics, these statistics still are valid. 63% more sentences for men. And don't you think that, you know, when we're talking about fairness, the other side should be given the equal opportunity to be heard? But what is the other side? I mean, what, what are you advocating as the other side? Are, are we playing devil, devil's advocate or um, I mean, why would is the other side? Like, I'm not saying, I, I, I have never argued that, that the, the fairness is part of incarceration, at least in the US or in most part of the world is, is gender based. It's, it's, it's not so much of a gendered problem. I think a part of it, it, part of it has to do with the, the, the female role in, in many societies, being the mother of, of children. Like, yes, they have a very strong incentive to stay out of jail, right? They have children and they're very But then it, would, it wouldn't be fair. Yeah, yeah, but that, that no, not necessarily. No, not? because like if they're not engaging in criminal behavior, why should they go to jail? Well, they are. That's, I would just tell you the report that okay, if they okay, are, okay, I'm going to balance okay, all the- Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so you're saying that that they're not convicted. They're, 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 they're still guilty. They're just not convicted. Yes, yeah, so they found out that, you know, um, women are twice as likely to avoid incarceration for the same crime committed uh, as men. Then oh, why should okay. these uh, concessions be made in terms uh, of fairness? I mean, I can understand the politically correct. Um, it's in fashion. You know, people get a lot of funding about these things. But when we talk mm. about fairness, we can talk about the other side also. Okay. No? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that that is a, t a tough question. I think it's it's on one hand you're thinking, well, if if, if you're putting a, a mother into jail, and and she her 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 children will have to go into foster homes. And that's that's worse for the children. It's worse for society. Also, child custody. So, yeah, like so if yeah, a but, woman is um, intoxicated, have drug history, have cr criminal behavior, she's more likely to get custody, even if the father um, is an upstanding citizen and earns more. Why is that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, here here you touch on a point. There's there's procedural fairness and there's outcome fairness, and and I'm I'm not. I'm not one to, I, as someone that works in, in machine learning, I tend to focus a lot on outcome fairness, but I see how it connects to procedural fairness, which is what the judges do. And actually a lot of the models now inform the procedure of fairness. So mm -hmm. like, I, I think there, there needs to be a discussion of how both connect and how we, we work on it. But I'm not the one to answer these complicated societal issues. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something more like for, for, for ethicists, for sociologists, for psychologists, like wh what, what are the pros and the cons? What is the cost? Like there's other societies, I'm not saying the US, in which incarcerated women get to stay close to their children. You know, and they're not, their children are not taken away from them. 
you know, and, and is, is that jail for the child too? How does the child deserve that? You know, so there's a lot of interesting questions in that, in, in that system. I, I would rather just tackle, but that's my point of view, just tackle the issues that cause, uh, that are the root cause of all these problems. You know, it's not like, like everybody dreams on, 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 on having a life of criminality. There's a per certain percentage of the population that's really small that does that. But this is engendered by poverty, is engendered by, you know, uh, violence in, 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 in movies and, and maybe some glamour that has associated to it. There's a lot of whole, a whole bunch of things that, that actually cause these issues. I rather focus on those things, uh, but till the society focuses on those things and incarceration is seen as a solution, I mean, how do we make it fair? <laughs> I mean, for one, I think uh, the, 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 the methods used right now, and this is completely out of my, 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 my breath of, of what I, I, I work in and I studied, but I think it's, it's uh, like other justice systems are, are more fair in the sense that they try to actually re rehabilitate. Mm. Uh, I'm I not sure that me. that's a system. I'm not sure that's a system we have here in many countries around the world. It's more like a punitive system. It's not a rehabilitation system, mm -hmm. right? So that 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 actually engenders more hate and animosity from a population that's incarcerated than one that that says, okay, and and this is not a politically correct thing to say, it, it, in the sense that what I ultimately want was the benefit of society. But for us, it's counterintuitive. You know, we say, well, you know, like why 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 should we? give a, a homeless person a home, you know, for free. What did they do to deserve it? But that's not the, the question here. The question is, okay, we want that person to be a useful person, uh, be, uh, you know, useful to themselves and to society. And the best way to do it is that, because otherwise they just go down a, a, a downward spiral where they're getting into drugs, prostitution. Uh, eventually they, they, they get into, in, into jail and that costs the society money. And they also go into, in, into hospitals and that costs society money. So like, is that better? I don't think so. So there'll be people that saying the, the, you know, coming from a place of, of restrained, um, you know, like uh, resources and say, well, in the wealthiest country in the world, we we can't give these people a house because we're we're because well we're not giving we're lending them one but that that is a better outcome in the sense that it, it, it might not seem fair but it's better for everybody in the same sense that rehabilitating people in jail might i mean in many countries it creates a better outcome than actually punishing them so it also depends on the crime Obviously, if a person is a is a serial rapist or or a murderer, you know, like what other choice do you have, you know, then lock them up. <laughs> um, but I I think that's not what we're discussing here. We're discussing petty theft, petty crimes, uh, you know, like maybe some violence, um, you know. So like that's the vast majority of people that are incarcerated. They're not necessarily murderers. I mean, when so, we talk about fairness and and friendship for um, transparency. I mean, I'm talking to you uh, about these things because um, some of your intelligence and states are certainly have a public opinion based on your experiences living on the both side uh, of the economic wall uh, in the Costa Rica and US. And now we, congratulations, you have recently gotten a green card also. Um, and certainly, mm -hmm. you know, you have a deep um, insight into how cultures work because all data scientists, you know, they're always trying to find patterns. Um, and you also talk about in your book um, when you talk about the data set um, of recidivism to uh, criminal behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think you cannot separate the machine outcome and fairness from the societal um, um, fairness um, and um, bias because uh, there is systematic racism. We have recently seen um, a Black Lives Matter sprung from George Floyd issue and then uh, we have anti-Asian crime and growing up and there are crimes against the community um, and a huge Islamophobia in US. That's a perennial problem for US. You know, it was built on, uh, you know, wiping out uh, Indians from the state. So um, not to get into a political domain, but fairness when we talk about that, especially because these Asian, uh, these African-Americans are being flagged as criminals through these AI systems that you talk about in your book. 
So tell about mm-hmm. your perspective, how the algorithms actually flag these people and what can be done to mitigate and generally why does the phenomenon happen? Because you certainly have more interesting opinions um, uh, apart from science also. Well, I think there, you know, this might not seem like, a, 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 you know, it's probably not a popular opinion, but I think actually I don't this trust- This is exactly why I want. <laughs> I don't trust human judges. I don't. Okay. Um, uh, I think there, there's been a lot of proof about this. And, and if you, if you re- actually read, um, I don't know, you read Daniel Kahneman's uh, yeah. Think Fast and Slow. Yes. We were talking about that like a couple of podcasts ago. Okay. Like he, there's this example and it's, it's been proven that judges pretty much in any, any capacity in any institution, like, you know, and, and, and this doesn't only apply to judges, it applies to anybody. They have decision fatigue. And the, the tendency is that after you have any kind of meal, meal. you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're more favorable. You're more favorable towards the, 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 whatever it is you're deciding. And the criminals and get end, more pearls if you if the judge is um, making a decision exactly. after lunch uh, versus before yeah. lunch. Exactly. So, like that, that in itself is a reason not to trust them. I think they're they're also biased. They whether they like it or not, they might not talk about it as 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 racial bias. They don't. They're not even aware about it. You know, it, it might not even be racial. They're just biased towards poor people or people that are disheveled or. Or, 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 or had some kind of drug history, um, whatever it is, there, there's, we all have biases. So I think there is an opportunity to use machine learning for good. But the only way that's gonna happen is by you know, not trusting the data entirely. So, uh, and, and also another thing is leaving, leaving very room for, for wiggle room because what the, uh, the Compass data set does, it, 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 it ranks, it, it ranks the, the compass data, I mean, I mean the compass model, it, it ranks people as low risk, middle risk, and high risk. And, and guess what happens to the middle risk people? They get bunched up with the high risk. So there's really no difference. So, so something I, 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 I try to discuss is that, you know, like when we're talking about people, you know, and we're, we're talking about risk factors, like, uh, you, you either, you first have to probably draw the decision line further up. So stop putting at a 50%, you know, threshold. Increase the likelihood to 90, you know? That's where you're gonna get the people that really should, probably should, should not get parole, right? Those are the people that, that are very, very much likely to, to get back into jail once they leave. You know, the, the, the problem with, with that nuance is that it, it's open for a lot of interpretation and I, and I want interpretation, but I want the right kind of interpretation. I think there is a bad kind of interpretation. If, if you just return, if your model only returns three things and nothing more, if it only returns high risk, middle risk, and low risk, and that's it, um, you know, like it, it's up to the person to decide what that means, you know? And so you, you want to restrict the amount of human bias in the decision, but at the same time, you want to assist it with a, with a proper explanation. And, and, and therein lies the trick. I think we, we can help judges make better decisions. You know, we, we, we can even help, um, you know, uh, credit agents, you know, the people that decide if you're approved or not for a loan to make better decisions, you know, if those still exist. <laughs> um, but we, we need them to work them in tandem, you know, because there, there, there has to be other considerations. There have to be a loop back too. In the sense that, like, say the model returns high risk, and the judge says, "No, I override that. I, I think this is low risk." Explain why. Explain this is the reason, and then maybe, maybe there's some kind of, um, you know, like the people training the model realize, "Oh, yeah, this is an exception to the rule. We should include this data into the model, or we should make this more relevant because this makes sense," you know, or they realize. Mm, no, the, 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 the judges are biased in this sense. So maybe we should return this other information because they don't quite understand what this means. You know? So there, there has to be, um, in many cases that are high stakes, uh, some decision science in there. You know, people that understand about psychology, 
which I, I'm, I'm not qualified to be that. Maybe you as a psychologist are, but there is a whole science, a cognitive sciences, people that can work through our quirks, through our own biases to help us make more uh, better decisions. You know, um, there's, there's, another, there's another reason I think it's also important and it is, um, there might be other things we can do like force judges to take a break, you know? You're, you're clearly getting fatigued. We see it in your eyes. So go off for a break, you know, <laughs> you know or something, you know, there, there are other things we could do. I think it's, it's, it's very important um, because these people are, are taking high stake decisions all the time. We need them to, to be, not only be focused, but be engaged. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a hard thing, I think. Um, and less corrupt yeah. also. Uh, let's talk yeah. about uh, <laughs> places where it can be actually useful also uh, in movie coded bias. They talked about um, how China is actually using their citizen information to uh, making um, purchasing um, a smooth experience. For example, you go to a shop, you buy something instead of paying, you could actually show their face and it's going to scan and you know they have your information already and then you can simply buy on the credit score. And you can also make uh, friends with uh, people who have good credit score. Um, so that's a very interesting portion and document you were talking about. Even though, you know, for people who are living in more democratic countries are kind of uh, um, horrified by the idea that, you know, government has everything. So on one side, it can possibly make your life easier. On the other side, you know, uh, there's a lot on stake. And I'm just wondering, um, in terms of machine learning and fairness, uh, once we have a lot of features and uh, selecting those features and how that impacts the explainability of the model, um, that becomes, you know, a dream within dream to quote um, uh, the movie. Um, and that becomes more hard to explain that. Uh, how do you actually make sure that uh, feature engineering helps the sparsity of the model and not uh, make it more hard? Feature engineering? Oh, yeah. Like, I, I think it's, a, it's an important concept. Like, um, and, and that harkens back to what I said about predictive part of power and explanatory power. Um, like often, if, if you want only predictive power, maybe even some features, you leave them alone, leave them the way they are. You might get a more performing model, but at the end of the day, you don't really understand you know, what's going on. But there's a lot of features that are connected. And, and the first example I give of that in the book is um, you know, height and weight. You know? Or another one I give is is a high, um, what is it called? Um, a cardio for cardiovascular disease. I discuss um, um, high blood pressure and low blood pressure. You know, the also talk about you know the term. And, and along sometimes, with, I'm sorry, yeah. I was just add, adding one more thing that you talk about in your book, which is Occam's razor, um, uh, yeah. which is uh, sparsity yeah. indicator. You just talk about that also. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I'm, I'm getting to that. So yeah, you must select the least amount of features. But another thing that is important is for the explained availability purpose, there are a lot of features that are highly relate, related to each other. And, and what's commonly done is said, okay, we, we leave them alone. We know they're related and, and, and they're going to work together to derive the best outcome. But sometimes they work together in counterintuitive ways. Sometimes their connection is nonlinear and it, it serves as well to understand what that relationship is. Like I mentioned, you know, like how low and high blood pressure are connected and how, you know, um, weight and height are connected. And they're not exactly like, okay, we just, you know, divide one from another or multiply them and that's it, or we subtract them and that's it. No, there's a, a, a more nuanced relationship between them. So it is important to understand what these are. And one way to kind of capture the essence of them is through feature engineering. So you create your own feature that captures what is really going on in these relationships. And, and then you only have one feature to deal with. So you, you, you reduced the amount of features by one, it might not seem a lot, but you also have a better indicator. Once you're trying to explain the model, you have a better indicator. So say you were, um, you were training a decision tree the decision tree will tell you, okay, like if this ratio between high and low uh, um, blood pressure is so and so, like, and then this is the outcome. If it's lower than this, then this is the outcome. Then you have something you can actually present as part of the model. This is what the model does. 
this is the explanation of how it does it. And um, it's a lot better than if you kept them separate. So there you have explanatory pow uh, power built, built in. And you could even take it further if, if you made a, 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 you know, a causal model with it. But that's, that's a, a, a next rung, if you will, um, which is, I, I think it's, it's, it's where a lot of this is heading. As, as, far, as, as far as like Alcan's razor, yes, I, I think sparsity is better and it's better in every instance. I mean, obviously there's some things that are inherently complicated. Human language is inherently complicated and there's only so much we can do um, to, to make it simple. Um, and in images is also another, another complicated, but the advantage is that there, there, there's some semantic connections within, within it. We don't get as much as tabular data. So um, I think with tabular data, especially when you have a, lot, a large amount of features, it's important to kind of, even if it's at the cost of higher accuracy, trying to extract the most you can out of the least amount of features, because it will generalize better. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately the most important thing. Um, the most important thing is that it generalizes better, not that it performs well on your, on your holdout in sample data. <laughs> uh, one other problem with the regular evasion um, and using dropouts for uh, making sure the model is sparse um, is at the cost of, um, cost of, um, ignoring the multicollinearity between um, two features. For example, if there is an interaction effect um, mm -hmm. and you, in order to sparse the model, you take one of them, you know, the other is going to be affected also and accuracy is going to come down. And that's kind of a perennial problem. How do you deal with that? Yeah, like uh, pretty much like neural networks are very hard to tame. I, I don't, I, I posed it as an example in, in, in a chapter where I used dropout, but um, it was mostly to contrast it against uh, TensorFlow Lattice, uh, which is a more controlled environment. Um, I, I'm actually, this is one of my biases. I, I don't tend to use um, um, neural networks for tabular data. I think their forte is unstructured data. I think that's where they excel. Um, and, and you'll find better results. And, and Dropout does work wonders, I think, in images. Um, but I, I think I only posed it as an example in, the, in, in that chapter, just to, to contrast it to uh, TensorFlow Lattice. And, and just to show something that could be used, even if it wasn't quite the, the right kind of data for it. Um, so like, I know people do use, um, neural networks on on um, on tabular data and and they try and then trying to understand what they what the outcomes mean is an important problem when you when you're using that methodology but um i my my favorite methods for tabular data are, are actually uh gradient boosted decision trees as you if you've seen I, I use a lot in my book i i think they they, they work wonders and they're they're a, you know, orders of magnitude more explainable than neural networks. <laughs> and I think one of the most favorite uh, that I've worked for me are random forest and uh, gradient boost uh, for many reasons. Neural networks can be, um, you know, good for a lot of nonlinear relationships when the stakes are not high. Um, but in general, you know, um, people tend to avoid them uh, if they are um, high stakes um, problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but you talk about four granular uh, levels of explainability. You talk about global holistic and modular and then local single and group predictions. Uh, tell us uh, about what these are and what case studies um, are for these um, to understand uh, what they are. Okay. Um, global level predictions, you're trying to understand um, how features relate to each other. And, and as a whole in the model. So you're, you're, you know, like a common method is this, is, is feature importance. You're, you're ranking the features, figuring out how important they are to the model. This has implications, as I said, for feature selection. It also has implications for understanding uh, what, what features you should focus on if, if, you, if you're gonna build other models with them. Um, it also, uh, another, another way is to derive something like a partial dependence plot um, there's many kinds, even uh, SHAP has his own version of it, 
uh, which will tell you how, as the value of the feature changes, uh, what, how does the outcome change? So it, you can only, you can even get granular on a feature level in the sense that you'll be able to know in aggregate, and that's a key word, in aggregate, how that um, the outcome will change as the feature changes. Um, so you know which feature values are the ones that correlate with the outcomes, the different outcomes of the model. So you know like, oh, high risk for this correlates with these feature values, not with these feature values. So that, that can have some implications in the sense that maybe you realize that you, you can pretty much encode that as a, uh, as a uh, binary feature. If you know like, high, you know, like pretty much it only matters if you're over 40 sticks for this particular kind of disease, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're less than that, you could make that into a binary feature. Over 46, one and or zero, and that's it. Um, so there's a lot of things you can learn and you can do with that information. Um, then the next case is local interpretations. So with um, local interpretations, um, you you have um, you're looking at a specific instance. You want to know why one decision was made for one particular instance. So you have an instance of interest, and you want to know. Uh, you know, what, what weighed in that particular decision, which is not the same thing as the aggregate level, as the global level. And I think I missed out on one, which was the global holistic. Mm -hmm. and, and the global holistic is unlike the global in the sense that that is a very rare thing. That is to understand the entire model, kind of like you take the model and you put it in a memory. And, and you need very few features for that to work. And it pretty much it can only be like a linear or logistic regression or, or a very simple decision tree for that to work. Um, so like, like say you had a two feature like a linear model and you know, like three times X plus four times X, you know, three times X plus four times C uh, plus three. And, and that's just, that's the formula uh, for your linear model. So you could re register that in memory and understand that's what it is that, you know, and, 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 and you can turn it into human language and, you know, well, like this outcome, if all things stay the same, uh, you know, like three times X will increase Y by one, you know, like you'll, you'll be able to capture that. Um, so that's, that's a very rare thing. So now we, global holistic and the global modular was the one I explained with the feature importance and all that. And then there's the local, which I, I, I just explained as being the predictions. And then there's the group of local when you have more than one, um, it's just repeating the same local several times. So you can, you can derive what the, what the reason for several predictions at once. And that can be very useful when you want to say, understand, and I think I do it in the book, uh, what's the reason for misclassification, several misclassifications. So you take a sample of several misclassifications, then you interpret the, the, the commonality between these misclassifications. And there might not be much uh, commonality. They might be completely different reasons, but you get a sense of why is it getting it wrong? Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems with that is that um, when we make models, we first, um, in the pipeline at least, theoretically, you first select features, and then you know you have this model and then interpretability um, and understanding how the model works. One of the things that you talk about in your book is another method of a feature selection, which is the recursive feature uh, mm -hmm. selection and the sequential feature selection. Just tell us a little bit about more, um, how does it actually work um, and how does it actually improve the model, both model accuracy and explainability? Well, uh, how feature selection in general uh, uh, works for explainability is less features. Are, are each feature adds noise to a model. It doesn't matter the model, each feature adds noise. I mean, um, so feature selection will decrease the noise and therefore increase the signal. So um, there is a balancing act there because some features might have like a marginal improvement on your outcomes in aggregate, um, but at the cost of making your model less generalizable. So 
the trick there is to find and in, in the example I choose for the book where I have like, I think like 400 features and I'm trying to bring, bring it down to, you know, like less than a hundred or 150, you know, tops, you know, try to bring them down. And the whole point of it is so it generalizes better. So there's a whole bunch of feature selection methods. They roughly come into like four categories. There's, there's um, you know, like um, <laughs> at the top of my head, I don't remember. Um, there's um, hybrid and then there's a more advanced methods and then there's uh, uh, completely filter-based methods as well. Um, and uh, the, the one you talk about, um, a recursive, I believe that is hybrid, a hybrid method. And so what you do is you pretty much have different groups, randomly get different groups of features and iterate through them, you know, um, using your, a model of choice, whatever model you want. Um, and then it, it filters based on that. Um, and then it, it finds what the best, uh, the most optimal results that you get with that. And that's kind of tricky because for, for our purposes, for interpretation purposes, it's very different than you would do it usually. Usually we do it to increase your, your uh, you're gonna get to a point where you actually increase your, your performance, your predictive performance, but it might generalize worse. So you're gonna wanna find a middle ground. And I, I find that in the chapter, measuring the train and the tests and what is, how, how the distributions um, well, there weren't so much distributions for the, the profit uh, for both align. Because the thing is, you want to make sure that, that um, the next time you run the model, it's going to have a similar pattern in the sense that it's going to achieve the same profitability at the same thresholds. So that's the, that's the nuance that in, is in that chapter. And the reason I use that is that a lot of times for, for, for these purposes, for feature selection, you're just looking through the highest accuracy you, and, and you're not looking at, at, uh, at uh, how, how train and test compare in terms of generalization. And, 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 and that's, a, uh, that's a misstep right there because you're, you're gonna run the model again on, on data that has a different distribution and you wanna make sure that it, that it matches. So, um, I, I think uh, to, to point back to your problem, uh, to your problem, to your question, I think there is, there is a, a lot of things and I, I think it's an integral part and that's why I, I made it part, uh, a chapter on its own that for things to be interpretable, you need the least amount of features. You need, a, you need to make it a, a, as sparse as possible because you'll, you'll find that it, it's not only gonna generalize worse, but it also, will be less, it will be harder to understand. Because as I said, uh, the more features, the more noise, the more noise, the less signal. <laughs> and if that maxim is true, uh, more features, um, more noise than less features, uh, more signal, then why do we actually um, put all models together? And we're talking about ensemble models here, blended models and staggered models. Uh, and that should definitely increase more noise to our model than yet people do that, especially in Kaggle, you do it all the time, both linear and non-linear. Oh yeah, yeah, but, I'm, <laughs> we, but here we're talking about the model architecture. We're not talking about, there's a stochastic process when you're, we're, when you're putting a, making ensembled models and, 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 and we have to keep that separate than the data. And how does it actually ensure that noise and signal problems still does not uh, appear in the blended models because by the logic, you know, if you're even doing feature selection and that would add uh, noise because, you know, there are a lot of features. I mean, if you're adding a lot of models, uh, then that definitely should add more noise as well. Yeah, but here we're not talking about uh, predictive power. We're gonna, we're talking about explanatory power. So like when someone is, is competing in Kaggle, they're, they're, not, they're not interested in explaining the model. And people do that in real life as, also. Yeah, they're more interested in getting the highest accuracy. And then yes. saying you can you can select features to the extent where and, and everybody running in a cattle model will at some point select features. And and they're gonna because by on purpose, either on purpose or by nature of the data, they're gonna have more features than you need. Right. So you're they're they're gonna select the, the optimal amount of features to get the highest amount of accuracy. 
but and and that might work for the holdout data set the the secret data set that they have for that competition but i'm saying long term when you're trying to generalize better it is best to understand the data best it's best to also you know keep it down even less than what it says you know like maybe maybe like 150 features will get you the optimal performance you know but uh when you try different uh, like many of these methods will will try subsets of the data, like many, many different subsets of the data. And, and we'll try, um, you know, uh, performing the best on each one and, and, and find which is the optimal amount where it will gen actually generalize better amongst all the different subsets. In, in, a, ca in a case like that, um, you, will, you will not match the performance you would if you just were, if you were just seeking optimal uh, accuracy on your holdout data set. If you were seeking optimal data on any data, then it's best to get even lower. So say you are 150, maybe 50 will do it. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm suggesting, but it, obviously it's not going to work in every scenario. I'm, I'm just Let's talk about people that are interesting specific case i mean in your current job we were talking about earlier about the food um mm -hmm. and agriculture science uh, that you're doing at the moment uh, and you probably you know brought it down to 150 or something um the features um mm -hmm. if I remember correctly or anything um but you know even with that um i, I believe it, it's a lot uh, hard to keep the uh, model parsimony how do you actually do that do you also use blended models um, or you simply use the features uh, I, I use blended models, but I mostly, I mostly rely, like most of my job is finding the right features, to be honest, is preparing the data, finding the right features, uh, you know, and I prepare it in such a way where I squeeze as much value as I can out of the features. So um, in, in that particular task, it's really in, uh, important to understand, uh, you know, what features matter and which ones don't. So, um, I, I, I do that through a lot of feature selection and engineering. And, and, and we're talking about features that are highly correlated because obviously agriculture has a lot to do with weather and weather has a lot to do with each other. So obviously the temperature is related to precipitation and the precipitation is related to humidity. They're all connected. So how can you tell which ones matter? And then there's a temporal aspect to it. You know, how far back is it important for the plant? And that's, that's no longer like in the domain of the weather, but it's how the weather connects to the growing of the plant and, and even possibly its susceptibility to disease. Mm. So then you start to understand things like, oh, like maybe it's not even in any scientific literature. And you realize that what is the precise threshold of humidity that is necessary for this tiny spore to actually become dangerous to the plant? What is the, the amount of you know, growth that the plant needs for it to be susceptible to this disease? You know, so you start to realize where, where the thresholds are and you turn these into features. And that's how you, you make a model that performs well under these circumstances. Like, and, 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 and a lot of it has to do with feature selection and engineering. And a lot of it has to, you know, you can't get there. You can't select the right features and engineer them appropriately without understanding how, how um, they connect to that outcome. And, and, and you can do that through the model, which is why I suggest to use uh, modeling for exploratory purposes. It's not typically part of an EDA. If you go to Kaggle and you see all the EDA notebooks, they're mostly, you know, here are the distributions of my features. Here's their, their Pearson's correlation plot and, you know, things like that, you know. I think uh, there's also certainly an aspect of multicollinearity and interactions with your features also, like you talk about humidity and uh, temperature. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about another way in which you um, have made it easier for people to describe the data. Um, and the biases. Uh, for example, you talk about in-processing and post-processing bias mitigation. And that was mm -hmm. a very unique concept. And this is what I really like about the book that, you know, it has most of the answers of my question. We are kind of on complex um, nature that other books don't cover like all in one. So th this, this, is, was a, this was something that I was very curious about. Just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, like um, 
it falls into what I, I talk about in chapter 14, which is there isn't like I had to come up with these things because these things aren't there isn't a term for it that I am aware of in literature, which is what what's the flip side to interpretability? How do you solve all the issues you have in interpretability? Right. And 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 that's a very important problem. Like, yeah, there is a, a discussion of what bias mitigation is, you know. But to me, it's really important how it connects to everything else, because like you bias mitigation in particular uh, connects to the fairness problem and, and to lesser degree to uh, accountability. But you 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 have issues with fairness. And so you deal with bias mitigation and you deal with them on on three parts, you know, in three particular areas and you deal with them directly on the data on the model, which is in processing and, and in the data is pre-processing and then post-processing, you deal with it directly in the outcome. The same goes for, for also robustness, adversarial robustness. You can deal with it in the data, you can deal with it in the model or in the model outcome. You know, like there's three areas and every method has that, like believe it or not. So it, to me, it's very interesting what you said about in-processing um, you know, pre-processing, in-processing, post-processing, or data model and inference, they, they all exist. Um, you know, so there, there's always things you can do on all three levels. And I suggest that you explore all three and you, and you actually could do all three at once. You know, not necessarily, you might get mixed results, you might get them better uh, or worse, but it all depends also on what your definition is of fairness and what the problem is. Um, so, like that's 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 perhaps the trickiest part of it, which is defining what fairness is to you and, and what are the underprivileged groups. Um, it's very tricky because um, uh, that that already falls in line into what you know, uh, you know, like you wish you had like some genie, like an AI ethicist that tell you, you know, like this is it. But it's still very murky. The uh, the idea of, of fairness in any problem, you have to understand uh, the society or whatever phenomena that connects to your data, um, you know, uh, <laughs> and that's gonna, that's gonna vary. Uh, what is the future for uh, interpretable AI finally? Um, the, the future, I think it's, as, as I say in the book, it's, it's, it's gonna have a seat on the table, it's gonna become more important. It's already, it's already there. I, I, I post some graphs in the book where you see it's, it, it, it's had a, a, a surge of, of, of interest in the last few years. And, and that's, that trend is gonna continue. It's gonna to be to the point that I think all models are gonna to have to be interpretable, uh, either by regulation or by self-regulation. I think a lot of people are gonna realize how important it is. And, and to me, I, I related in the last chapter to, to flying a plane with only very few controls. And I think that's the, that's the way planes were in the 1930s where you had a stick and only like a few dials. That's how we're, that's why, how we're piloting models right now. That's where we are. So yeah, we're no longer in like the, you know, the first planes that were made out of wood and, you know, like, uh, you know, we're no longer there, but we're still in that stage. So what are the dials to me? What are those different, those are all the different interpretability methods. We need those to properly pilot a plane. So before we get into, like the new age of, of aviation for machine learning, you know, like we need uh, more, we need everybody to use it, first of all, and we need more of them. We need better of it, you know, and we need to make everything more robust because what I see going on in machine learning is a lot of projects don't take off. And when they take off, they, 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 they cause harm, you know, so uh, we have to, place all the guardrails so that doesn't happen. And the, the only way that's going to happen is, is if we, we, we make sure that every machine learning process has all the dials and that people are actually looking at them. They're forced to look at them. So even though I'm, I like AutoML and I think it's also part of the future, I think AutoML must have built-in interpretability it must have a process where it's it's kind of prompting the user, hey, I found this, 
What do you think? Do you think we you should do this? Because he has the capacity to look at all these different, go through a decision tree and look through all the different uh, parts where there's potentially some issues, you know, like it could test the data for, you know, potential sources of bias, um, potential sources of, 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 of uh, you know, like say it found data set with very, very little representation of one category. There's so many ways of dealing with that. It, it should ask you, how should I deal with this? You know, should I omit these categories? Should I, 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 uh, I find a way of, 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 of equalizing them, making sure they're all the same? You know, like there's so many different ways that kind of problem can be fixed. So I think a combination, what, what's in the future for interpretability is going to be largely shaped by that. We have AutoML, MLOps, um, and, and we also have at the same time um, a, a, more, a, a greater need for interpretability as a whole. Um, and then uh, I think also what comes next, hopefully, is more causal modeling, which I think is, is pretty much a holy grail of, of, of making these robust decision machines because we have to get past thinking of things in terms of correlation and, and think of causal or causability. So that's, that's the, next, um, the next frontier, I think. And, and, and maybe it will get to that, uh, it will go in that direction and I hope so. Yeah, I think with um, cheaper um, access to 5G and cloud and computing power, uh, we'll certainly get to the point where we can actually afford to have um, connotations about um, explainability on big data side. Um, and certainly you also talk about in your book about um, AI publications, uh, public relation blunders. Um, there was a report by AI now in 2019, and hopefully you know we're going to avoid that also. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, State of the AI report. It was 2019 mm -hmm. or 20. I mean, and, you know, it seems like we have got AI in every aspect of, of our life and where there is probably a point of no return where we could get to the simpler um, life without the computers making the scene for us. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Serge. Um, it's been a, such a wonderful conversation, uh, a very deep and profound one. Uh, you've tackled one of the most challenging issues of our times. Um, and it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, likewise, it was a, a pleasure to talk to you and um, look forward to talking to you again in some other point. And uh, thank you for reading my book and, 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 and getting interested in it. Thank you so much.